morning. We've got two passages of Scripture I want you to turn to. Ruth chapter 2, little book of Ruth, chapter 2, and 2 John. 2 John, there's only one chapter there. We're going to look at verse 8. So Ruth chapter 2 in one hand and 2 John in the other. That would be just, uh, just before Jude and Revelations. So you'll see 2 John and 3 John. <clears throat> Small books. Title of the message this morning is A Full Reward. Now, I brought a message in January about the true riches. This is about having a full reward and, and um, some things you need to know about that. Um, it's got to be, you know, besides being saved, this is really, really an important, an important issue, an important thing for a Christian because it has to do with eternity. And you're only going to have a certain window of opportunity to avail yourself of these riches and then no more. And it's, that's why it's that important. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, he says there, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And in 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Every Christian in here should want a full reward. Let's have a word of prayer and I'll comment some more on this. Father, we ask your blessing now on the message. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for those here today. Uh, Lord, talking about rewards, talking about an eternal re inheritance that, is, uh, that we have to work for, not the one that's given to us because we're sons, but one that, uh, that we work for, like Jesus Christ worked for his eternal inheritance. And Father, I just pray that you would uh, bless now this message. May we see its importance and ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. There's a couple things in this passage. Um, you know, it's, you know it's, it has to do with works because he says in Ruth, in Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work. Okay? We're not talk, I'm not talking about salvation this morning. I'm not talking about being born again. I'm talking about after you are saved and born again. And why you should work for the Savior. You should work for the Lord. It says, uh, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward. Uh, the Bible says we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. The heirs with God is something you're going to get because you're a son. Okay, You're going to get a mansion. You're going to get a, uh, a body that is incorruptible and, and undefiled. and Well, that's the, that's the whole inheritance there. Incorruptible, undefiled, and fadeth not away. You're going to have an eternal body. Okay, There are certain things you're going to get just because you're saved, just because uh, you're in the Father's house. You're going to get those things. But then there's, you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came to this world, he had to live a sinless life, which gave him the right to be the king over the kingdom of heaven. And then he purchased a bride because he went to the cross for her. Uh, there is an inheritance because of, of what he did. In the, in everything in this universe belongs to him. Why? Because God's going to give it to him. Everything. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to give it out to you. He had to work and earn what he got as far as that inheritance goes, and so do you if you want this inter eternal inheritance. I want to show you a verse. Well, first, let me first mention this before I get ahead of myself. Notice that you can have a full reward. The Bible talks about 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. You want to fall within those three because there's one beside that. It's called zero. But 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Somehow that's how that breaks down, and Christians are either fruitful, 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. Um, if you want a full reward, you're going to have to work to get it. No exceptions. Um, no trophies for just participating or just standing there. Or even for non-participating. Uh, God's not giving out trophies for nothing. Not these. And... You can lose it if you're not careful. So you can get a full reward. You'll have to work for it. And you can lose it if you're not careful. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to verse here. I want to show you something. 
we read over this verse and so quickly we don't really see what it says. Paul's talking about what it, the, the trouble that he goes through and why he goes through it. He says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes. He's talking about people that are saved. He says, I endure these things for their sakes. Why? That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Well, that's got nothing to do with Paul enduring something. But notice it says, with eternal glory. How many of you are saved? How many of you are saved with eternal glory being tacked on the other side of that thing? You know what that tells me? That tells me that whatever I'm earning or whatever I'm working for here and now, that if I get it, it is eternal glory. I don't know what all that means. I'm not sure. I've got some ideas of what that means. Whether you might be a little brighter, you might have a little be better clothing, you might have a crown, you might have a, a kingdom you're going to rule. I believe in all that, those things. I'm not sh quite sure, but all I know is it says with eternal glory. Paul endured things so people would know you want to do this, you want to suffer this, you want to, uh, you want to be persecuted. Not that you try to be, but if you are, you should be happy about it. Not sad. Why? Eternal glory. When you win people to Jesus Christ, eternal glory. And you want a full reward. I mean, all we think about most of the time, most of the time, most of the time is now. Now. What do we got now? What are we getting now? What are we trying to have now? But man, that's not it. And I'm not saying you've got to take care of life. You've got to work. You've got to pay your bills. You've got to eat. You've got to have a roof over your head. I understand all that. You've got to have a car to drive. I had to do. I, I've, got, I've got all those things myself. But man, are we missing the boat here? When we don't realize that what we need is something with eternal glory, not something temporal. And are we working in that way? I know one thing. God's, God is a, a record keeper. He keeps records. Thank God. He's got, he's got me up there in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Hebrews 6.10 it says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. One of the things I want to tell you is this. You might have forgot what you did, but God doesn't forget it. None of it. If you did something out of love for him, if you ministered to the saints, uh, and you, you did something for them, God remembers it. There's some things that we think about. Well, oh, yeah, that won't amount to nothing. No, God doesn't forget anything. He's a record keeper. Now, granted, he's going to look at your motive. If you did it for a pat on the back from the brethren, well, maybe, maybe, maybe that'll tarnish that reward. I don't know. But I know there are a lot of things, man, that Christians do and do, do around here and never get a mention from the pulpit. I don't mention their name. They do it every week. They take care of things every week. Nobody knows who they are. Nobody even knows who, well, they don't, most people don't know who even does it. Even in a small church like this, you wouldn't know who does everything. Now, I do. I don't get up here and pat them on the back. But I know who's going to say, well, I remember that. I remember you doing that. I remember you doing that every week, matter of fact. We'll find out it's just not a ministry of faith. It's more than that. Um, God is going to reward you according to your own labor. You're not riding in on anybody's coattail. You're not going to get something because Grandpa was a preacher. Okay? You're not going to get something because... Now, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. When you're husband and wife, you're heirs together. Okay? You know what that means? Ladies... Please free up your husbands enough to serve God. Why? For your benefit, too. Because you're not getting a reward if they don't. You're heirs together. Now, I think the woman can minister just as much in different ways. She can be a witness. She can even preach. She can't preach up here, but she can preach out there. Preach! Maybe you don't get on a street corner and preach, but, you know, when you're talking to somebody and you're giving the gospel, you're preaching at them. 
but it's going to be according it's going to be according to your own labor and of course like I say a husband and wife are working together uh, my wife tells me when I go out the door she tells me this every week get ready to go to the, uh, jail I say okay I'm going to jail see you later she goes bring back some fish but now she's washed my clothes she's fed me that day she's taking care of everything I need taking care of the house while I'm gone what freed me up to go every week you think she's not going to share in the reward one saved this week three saved last week 250 to 300 saved over a period of six years you think she's not going to be a, a partaker of that I couldn't do that if she didn't help me so that's how a lot of women don't realize just how important they are to this reward building don't be Bible talks about the woman whose hands are bands. Don't be that woman where you just strangle hold them and say, no, they're mine, they're just for me, 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 me. You better let that guy go. Let him go do something for God. Why? Because you're the one that's going to suffer the loss if you don't. He said in 1 Corinthians 3, 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. In other words, if you didn't do it, you're not going to get anything. Now, you're still going to be saved. You're still going to have a new body. You're still going to have your mansion. You're still going to live in New Jerusalem. We're not going to call you an outcast. We're not going to look down on you. We're not going to treat you mean. We're going to love you. It's you that's going to regret not shining a little brighter in eternity and not getting as much as you could get because God's offering this to you. God affirms that the laborer is worthy of his reward. 1 Timothy 5.18 says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Just be careful you're not getting your reward down here. Or at least all of it. I mean, many preachers are paid to preach. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on you know, my preaching to give me an eternal reward necessarily. I want to do something else just to make sure. Why? I get paid to preach. Now, maybe I'm not getting exactly what I think I ought to get. That's between me and God and, and eternity. But he says the labor is worthy of his reward. There's some that labor in the doctrine, he said, are worthy of double honor. Well, if, if, if that's not paid here, it's got to be paid later because he says they're worthy of it, right? I'll bank on that. I'll bank on that. Kind of hope that. Colossians 3.24 says, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. It's about service. It's about work. It's about laboring for the Lord. Um, you have to involve yourself. Now, some, some Christians are newborns, and they need to sit there, and they just need to grow. Okay? Okay? But then there's Christians who have been saved for a while. They need to involve themselves in service that God rewards. It's imperative. I mean, this is your shot. This is your chance. This is your window of opportunity. At the sound of the trumpet, you go up and out of here. That's it. That's it. Your window is eternally shut. Why? You can never serve God in the same capacity that you can serve him now. Some of you came to church, you didn't feel too good today, did you? Maybe you felt poorly. Maybe you're suffering from a headache. Maybe you're suffering from a stomach ache. Maybe you're just suffering aches and pains, but you came to church anyway. Why? You realize that's the only time in eternity you can ever serve God and you don't feel good? When you can ever do something for God and it costs you something. It costs you comfort or... It, People come here from different times. They're uh, spending their gas to get here. This is the only time in eternity you, you could ever sacrifice anything. This is the only time in eternity where the deck is stacked against you and you get to still get to serve God, and it'll pay off. This is it. This is the window. How you feel today is today and how you earn a reward. Don't ever think it's just going to get easier. It doesn't. The older you get, the more you start slowing down. Oh, I can feel myself slowing down. I don't want to. 
But I'm going to have to eventually. Or drop over dead, which is okay too. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1.3. three. give you three types of uh, things here that God rewards. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. He says they're remembering without ceasing. Now Paul's talking about this, but remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Three things there. First one is the work of faith. You know what that is? That's stepping out for God with an unforeseeable end. That's faith. Faith is you never see the end of it. You're stepping out. I've done that a few times, stepped out. You know, it's like Peter when he stepped out of the boat to walk to the Lord on the water. That had an unforeseeable end to it, right? But he did it anyway. Peter wasn't that bright, but he did it anyway. <laughs> I mean, he stepped out of that boat, and the only time he really had a problem was when he got his eyes off the Lord, right? That's when he began to sink, and the Lord reached out there and grabbed him. But a work of faith is stepping out for God with an unforeseeable end. The mission field is uh, a work of faith, where you're supporting missions, or supporting missions. That's a work of faith. When you put money in that box for those fellas and ladies and all, all the folks over there that are in foreign lands, when you put money in for them, man, you don't know where, it's like a black hole. Sometimes I refer to the, the mission program as the black hole. Money goes in, nothing seems to come back out, except for maybe a letter or two. And some of those letters, well, we had this many saved and that many saved. And, you know, because you're holding the rope, you know, and you're providing the stuff, you, you get some of their reward. You become a partaker of it. But that's, that's by faith. I give to missions by faith. There's the pastorate supporting uh, and supporting your local church. Uh, the pastorate's a work of faith. You never know how it's going to end. Uh, never a dull moment. Evangelism, investing in evangelistic endeavors, soul winning, things like that. That's a, uh, a work of faith. But you know that prayer is a work of faith. It's even called labor in the Bible. You know, I think that's some of the most precious labor there is, is prayer. You can, you can, listen, you can have the ability to do a lot of things, but if God doesn't get in it, it ain't going nowhere. It, one watereth, one soweth, but who gives the increase? God does, doesn't he? If there's going to be increase in anything, God has to do it. And uh, so that's something to consider. Do we ever labor in prayer? Yeah, it's one of the hardest. There'd probably be great rewards for laboring in prayer. Why? Because so few people do it. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to roll out of your bed and onto your knees and pray. I've been trying to practice that every day now. I still have days when something happens, something occurs, but I'm trying to do that consistently every day because for 50 years I didn't. 50 years 30 35 40 years I didn't not consistently um, so that's a work of faith then there's a labor of love that's work that does not require faith but must be done nonetheless you know there's a lot of that <laughs> I heard a lot of work that's done for the Lord that doesn't require any faith but does require to be done see how nice the grass looks out there that got done. You don't know who did it. Most of you don't. I know who did it. Didn't require much faith. A little skill on a mower, but didn't require much faith. That's a labor of love. You know, I've run into Christians, and, and this is one thing, I, you know, I try to tell them. They really don't have anything to offer in the faith department. They're, they're not called to preach. They're you know, Scripture doesn't seem to be their forte, but they are so talented in so many different ways, I like to strangle them alive. <laughs> Me being the dunce that I am. And I see these guys that are so talented in what they can do, and you'll see them get this kind of attitude like, oh, I'm tired of being used. Man, you ought to thank God. You're, you're not, there's nothing else that God can use, buddy. 
And if you can do a labor of love for somebody, even if they are using you, think about the, the you've got to think about what you're going to get later for it. It could be a labor of love. Better consider those things. God, did, Whatever God's given you, he's given you that ability to use for somebody, to help somebody, be a blessing to somebody. People are going to use you all the time. Who cares? I don't care. Use me. If it'll get me a reward and glory, an eternal glory, I don't care. Why would I care about that? The folks don't understand that. Then he mentions the patience of hope. That could be like the trial of your faith, you know. I mean, patience of Job and the hope of the resurrection, the patience of hope there. In 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than that than, than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He mentions praise, honor, and glory at the appearing. That, I mean, that's when you're going to get that reward when you appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. You know what that is? That's enduring some things. And you know, you say, well, we really haven't had that kind of opportunity. Well, hang on. <laughs> hang on to your seat because you might, you might just get it. You might just get the opportunity to endure. A trial of affliction. The way things are going, man, I don't know about you, but it ain't looking good. It ain't looking good. Now, there's accepting the conditions of service before you start. Look at the 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. The Bible talks about striving lawfully. And if you don't strive lawfully, you don't get crowned. So don't just figure out some cheap way or some slick way of doing things that the Bible doesn't back up. Be careful of that. A lot of preachers have used gimmicks to, to, to build a church. I refuse to. Why? Because I don't see Jesus Christ handing out any gimmicks or having any gimmicks. If he did, I would. I've told you that before. Before we got this church, they had these two, these two lights removed, and they had these orbs in the place of it. And they told me that uh, one of the reasons they removed those is so they could have a bouncy house in here. Yeah, I mean, a full-size bouncy house was in, this, it was in this auditorium. It blew up with air so kids could jump in it, you know. If I find one of them in the New Testament, we will have a bouncy house. I've been looking, you know, and kind of reading it through 10, 20 times, and I still can't find a bouncy house. If I can find a gimmick in here anywhere, man, we will have gimmicks. Huh? That's right. Yeah. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll grill out, we'll kill the fatted calf. I mean, you know, if, if that's the way God wants it done, that's the way we'll do it. I just haven't found it yet. I'm still looking. Bozo the Clown, we'll hire him. I even dress up in a clown outfit. People get saved and that's the way God wants it done, I'll do it. I just never saw Jesus Christ do that. I never saw the Apostle Paul do that. I saw him labor, I saw him suffer, I saw him preach on the street and in the marketplace. I can see that. I just can't see where they had the gimmicks. I think it's just kind of worldly. You say, well, they're getting people saved. Yeah, but not lawfully. Listen, they may get people saved. They might. They might get a few saved. But when they stand before the Lord, if they didn't strive lawfully, what will they not get? They won't get that crown. If I'm going to strive, if I'm going to work for the Lord, I'm going to work lawfully. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You're not doing this for nothing. Like I said, God's got a long memory. He's not going to forget anything you do in his name for his sake. Now, if your motive's impure, he'll, he'll bring that out. But if your motive's pure and you just want to do it for the Lord, you're doing things for the Lord, that's fine. 
But notice he says steadfast. You are firmly fixed in, in devotion of duty. Don't tell God you're going to do it not do it. Don't do that. The Bible says God taketh no pleasure in fools. Yeah, that's right. Better not to vow and to vow and not pay. <laughs> um, just tell God, by your grace, Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Wherever you tell me to go. And then you make sure it's the Lord telling you that. But steadfast, you're firmly fixed. Okay? It's like, when I got in church, I got in. Now, when I get out, I get out. All the way. And then I got back in. All the way. That's the way you got to be, man. If you're going to get in, get in. Get in with both feet. I would that thou art cold or hot. You want to be hot for the Lord? Then get in all the way. You want to be cold? Well, go all the way. <laughs> I mean, you might as well, because riding the fence and being lukewarm, it makes him vomit. He said, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. So be steadfast. Be unmovable. In other words, you will not be deterred from your work for God. It says, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Unmovable. You don't get deterred from it. In other words, when you get sidetracked, you get right back on track. Because you're going to get sidetracked. You're going to have things that lead you this way and that way. You're going to get sick and have some downtime. You're going to have this. You, what you, you get back up, you regroup, and you go again. Why? If you're done, you're dead. If he's done with you, aren't you dead? Or you hope you are? I mean, you know, you could be you could be 110 years old, you know, and you can't even move, but you, if you can still pray, the labor in prayer. God knows we need it, right? So let me give you a few here. Well, I, miss, I don't want to miss the last one. Always abounding in the work. That means to be full of or plentiful. The Bible talks about abounding in giving, abounding in prayer, abounding in all kinds of things. What, what means you're always doing more of it, increasing it, or being full of it? Full of it? You're being full? <laughs> you're, you're always doing it because you want, you realize you need to abound in it. Okay? You never, you never satisfy with what you're doing today. Maybe God will have you do something else tomorrow or more tomorrow or to be a bigger ministry tomorrow, or a bigger opportunity tomorrow. Always abounding, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, you do not have to be a somebody to have a full reward. If that's the case, then most people wouldn't. Most of us are nobodies. You could say my name and people go, who? Of course, there's plenty of people with my name, so they might come up with somebody else. Uh, they might say your name, and they say, who? Who's that? You're not a Christian celebrity. You're not famous. You're not... Can you have a full reward? Well, according to the Scriptures, you can. There's some, there's some people in the New Testament that Paul mentioned. He said in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia. Remember where Achaia was? It's Corinth. That's the area where Corinth is in. It may have been, it could even have been Athens, but Achaia. And, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That's a work of faith, man. Here you've got a man, he's, a, I mean, he's addicted to the, to the ministry. With all the addictions out there, that's the only one in the Bible that, that says you could be addicted to. Be addicted to the ministry. You think Stephanus saying, you, you, you think he ain't got a full reward? The man's life. The man's life, it, was every, every, it, it evolved around ministry. I, you know, there are, there are guys that, that they get ate up with it. Uh, I, I think they're evangelists. You can always tell an evangelist, he just, he's, he's just, you know, doctrine's not his forte, but he knows, he should know his doctrine, but he's just ate up with telling somebody about the Lord. It's just all the time, and that's all he wants to do. That's all he can think about. And every day he sees somebody, he sees an opportunity. As God, God puts that in your heart, I don't have the heart of an evangelist, although I want to go and win people to the Lord. I just don't have that, that overdrive like an evangelist would have, like Philip the evangelist. Every time he turned around, God had him somewhere witnessing to an Ethiopian eunuch. He drug him out in the desert for that guy. 
And then he took him right back into Samaria to preach a revival in that, in that town. He winds up at Caesarea where he lives. It's a port town. Why do you think he's there? Because people are coming in and out. The beloved Persis. This is Romans 16, 12. It says, salute Tryphena and Tryphosa. Are those twins? I don't know what that is. Tryphena and Tryphosa. Maybe brother and sister. I don't know. Um, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Okay? Just talk it. Paul just talked about these, these individuals that he knew was serving God and laboring for God. You think God's going to forget? He's not going to forget anything. Every time you do something with the right motive and with the right attitude and you want to do something for the Lord, He's going to remember it. Epaphroditus, Philippians 2, verse 25 to 30. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you, Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor fellow soldier, but your messenger. So not only is he a companion in labor with Paul, he's a messenger. And he that ministered to my wants, oh, he's taking care of Paul. I mean, he says a lot, says a lot I believe Epaphras and Epaphroditus are the same individual. He talks a lot about this guy. You know what this guy's doing? Whatever is needed, he's doing it. Need me to run a message? I'll take it to him, Paul. I'll run it to him. I can take it to him. What do you need, Paul? What do you need? I'll go get it. He's ministering to Paul's wants. Well, I could use some parchment and a pen. I need to write some more letters. I'll get it, Paul. I'll get it. Companion in labor and a fellow soldier. He's a soldier. It says, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also. Man, I, he, I'd have lost a good companion. I'd have lost a good friend. I'd have lost somebody who's helping me. He said, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him, therefore, the more carefully. I mean, this guy was evidently, he was reckless. He was spending his life. Paul said I would, Paul said I would, uh, Oh, how's it go about being spent? Ah, oh, can't think of it. Yeah, I'm willing to spend and be spent. That was Epaphroditus, too. It was costing him, costing him his health. So I sent him, therefore, the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. In other words, man, acknowledge what this guy's doing for God. So that other people will follow his example. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. We say, working yourself to death. Well, if you're going to do it, do it for God. Don't do it for the world. It says, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Somebody else should have been helping Paul out. And Epaphroditus stepped up and did it for them. Epaphras is mentioned again, if it's the same guy. Um, Colossians 1 7 says, As you also learned of Epaphras, our, fellow, uh, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. This guy's covering the gamut, man. He's not only doing a labor of love, he's not only trying to help minister to Christians, he's uh, ministering the word to the saints. In chapter 4, verse 12 of Colossians, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. <laughs> you think he ain't got a full reward? He was nine to death. What else could God ask of him? But he's doing it all. I mean, you don't have to just be, you know, uh, pigeonhole everything. Well, this is what I do, and this is only what I do. Uh, you know, I could have done that. And about 250 to 300 souls wouldn't have got saved out of the prison, or I wouldn't have been the one to be there to preach the messages when they got saved. If I'd have thought that way. But my Bible says, to a pastor, do the work of an evangelist. In other words, 
Get your sorry self out there and preach. I didn't want to. I'll be very honest with you. I like it now. <laughs> but I didn't want to. That wasn't my thing. At least that's the way I felt about it. And the Lord said, I don't care whether it's your thing or not. Get out there and do it. He said, laboring fervent for you in prayers that you may stand perfect, complete all the will of God. And then in Philemon, verse 23, he says, therefore salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus. Just a lot said about this man. I think he's got a full reward. How about a lady? Romans 16, 1, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is in Chincrea. You know, he mentions her twice. To God only be wise, be glory through Jesus Christ for every amen. Written, well, it's a postscript um, written to the Romans from Corinthians and sent by Phoebe, the servant of the church at Chincrea. So what was she doing? Whatever she could. Whatever she could. Did it take much faith? Well, I mean, it took faith to get from point A to point B, but probably didn't take a lot of faith. But it took some labor, took some time, took some sacrifice. She's willing to do it. You know, I got to thinking about all those women that took care of Jesus Christ. Because he talks about them standing afar off. They didn't want to look on him because he was naked on that cross. And they didn't want to add to his shame. And they stood back from a distance. And it was all those women that ministered to him. Somebody washed his clothes. And I said, after, you know, he wasn't multiplying fish and bread every time he turned around. He did that a couple times, but somebody had to feed him. And here's all these women that fed him meal after meal and took care of him. They did. They ministered to him. You think he's going to forget about it? That alabaster box being broken? He didn't forget. A lot of work that the ladies do may not take a lot of faith, but it does take a lot of labor and a lot of sacrifice. And he's not going to forget that labor of love. But one of the key things there, I think, is, is when he talks about that, um, not just the labor of love, but the, um, I'll get it here in a minute, the patience of hope. That is sooner or later you get to go through something. I don't know what it's going to be for you. I've been through a few things, nothing really major. I mean, nothing that earth-shattering. We might see that before it's over with. And how you react. When you're going through it, are you a Christian? Is your faith still in God that he's still in control? Or are you losing it? Me first, you last, dog eat dog, and along with the rest of the world. We're going to find out, I got a feeling, if the Lord tarries, I think we're going to find out. Because I think the whole thing's going to bust apart. I know one thing, when it's all said and done, I want a full reward. And I hope you do too. I don't think, I don't think you've got to just be, you know, uh, you know, some Christian celebrity to get that. In fact, I think that's probably the opposite of what you want to be. But what I want to tell you is that the only way you're going to get a full reward is if you start laboring and start being a part. Start doing things. Start witnessing. Start praying. Start reading your Bible. All those things. Listen, you can't have, possibly have the patience of hope without the faith of the Scriptures. You've got all these things are intertwined that if you grow right and grow proper, you will serve the Lord. And you'll do something for Him. It doesn't matter whether it's outside this church or in this church. Labor's labor. I hope that helped you. I'm going to bring a message here in a couple weeks. Paul, I believe, is preaching next week. Um, week after that, I'll show you how to lose a full reward. <laughs> I mean, I know this one's so uplifting, you know. Wait till you get to the one where you can lose it. But let's all stand. I've gone too long. Well, it's not too bad. Could have been worse. Thank you all for being patient.